Welcome to the Legendary Upside Podcast. My name is Pat Perrain. You can find all of my content at legendaryupside.com. Today, I am joined by the guys who are going to be helping out with playoff best ball content at Legendary Upside. Got Sacrilegious, Daniel Raz, Kyle Dvorak. Guys, how's it going? It's good. Uh, Sack, you, I, I was late to the uh, stream yard chat and then we had trouble getting me in. Uh, you are like, you said you were delirious yesterday and sick, but you are doing better right now. Things are okay. Uh, you'll be with us for the entirety of the contest, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, provided that I don't die before then. Uh, no, I, uh, not to, not to overshare here, had a brief stint in the hospital this weekend. So that was fun. Uh, it seems like it was just a, a pretty bad stomach bug, but, uh, yeah, knock on wood. I'm, I'm on the mend, um, was, was battling delirium, had like maybe four total hours of sleep over the last like 96 hours of my life. So that was special. Um, but yeah, excited to be here, chopping it up about playoff best ball and, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Sack is a gamer. He, he's talking playoff best ball. He's still got a hospital bracelet on. He's a, <laughs> he can't keep him down. <laughs> I mean, yeah, nothing is going to get between me and Max entering the gauntlet again. I mean, there's just <laughs> no way. Daniel, how are you doing? Doing well. Life's good. Only two weeks of finals starting today. So excited to get those over with and then Max the gauntlet and other contests. Nice, nice. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the gauntlet, um, kind of other... Uh, playoff best ball content. Underdog's got the wild card going on right now, which will probably be closed by the time you actually listen to this. But they've been rolling out playoff best ball content um, over the last couple weeks in smaller contests. And so, you know, we know the the big flagship contest is, is around the corner. Um, and wanted to get into today some higher level discussions on how to attack these contests. We will have additional content coming out um still working on exactly uh what like a, a version of rankings would look like for this but we have some we have a pretty cool idea uh we're, we're kind of dial that in that'll be for legendary upside subscribers and some of the additional content coming out i'm planning to do as premium content uh on the premium podcast feed that legendary subscribers have access to um and premium youtube videos as well so if you're interested in that, uh, go ahead and sign up at legendaryupside.com. But this, obviously, as, you're, as you've listened to it, is, is completely free. And we're going to get into, I think, some pretty valuable stuff here uh, in terms of how to attack these. I think, I think this type of best ball is really interesting because um, even more than regular best ball, I think it provides some edges. It runs counter to some it's kind of in the natural ways that I think we want to play fantasy. We want to play fantasy through players. We don't want to have to worry so much about roster construction. You know, if we're just out there having fun, firing at our best players, but roster construction is really important. Picking players on, on specific teams is very important. And uh, I, I think that can kind of get a little bit uh, lost for, for people as they want to basically uh, play the best plays. I also think, like best ball mania the intuitive thing to think through these contests is first i need to advance round one then i need to advance round two then i need to advance round three and then i need to win the final but it's almost sometimes you want to think about it in reverse is that so much money is in the final uh daniel you were running some numbers on on this the kind of the importance of being live in the final do you want to just kind of take us through that real quick yeah, so last year in the gauntlet, $200,000 went to first place in the final. So ideally, you're seeing that. That's a lot of money. I want to maximize my chance of that. This is a $25 entry tournament. If you were to simply advance out of the first round but not advance later, you would get $40. So not chump change, but if you have a choice between fully optimizing your teams to get first in the wild card round but not really considering the Super Bowl implications, you're at best, not even doubling your money. And that would be if every other thing went right. Or you could be trying to optimize for the Super Bowl and take as much of a probabilistic shot at 200 grand as possible. One of the ways that um, I think, you know, I've done, so this is not obviously going to be about the FFPC playoff contest. I do plan to do content on that this year. But, you know, when I've done content there, a lot of it is like you're kind of figuring out your bracket in the way 
the bracket is going to go. Um, Zach, you've kind of talked about this as like maybe a simpler version of that is not, rather than trying to figure out exactly how each matchup is going to play out to draft one of these, which, and these are quick drafts and, you know, you might be on your phone, like, like imagining a full, a full bracket can be a bit uh, tough to get your head around in that, in that kind of setting. What, how are you, how are you kind of viewing this? If we're playing for the later rounds, if we understand that we need to maximize the Super Bowl, are you just trying to like, pick the two teams that are making the Super Bowl, or what do you think the best way to go is? Yeah, good question, Pat. If you've played playoff best ball before, you've heard the conventional wisdom of you need to draft backwards like your two teams that are going to the Super Bowl, you know who they are, and you're drafting players from them to make sure that you have five players live in the Super Bowl. Uh, for example, in last year's gauntlet, there were only eight total teams that could field a full five-man roster in the 157-man final. So if you had one of those eight teams, you had a one in eight chance at, at the first place of $100,000, which was pretty, pretty yeah, those, good. Those teams are like locked in for like, if they run horrifically bad, like first through 20th or whatever. Like, But realistically for any for what we care about, like we hardly even care about 20th place, those lineups are the only, literally the only ones that have a chance at first place and they're also probably very, very likely to go one, two, four, six, eight, nine. Like they are so much more likely. It's not like in regular best ball where like, oh, I had, oh, I have an injured backup tight end, but you know, I can still maybe get lucky and my one tight end gets there. You were literally just taking zeros 100% if you can't field a five out of five in that final round, which is why I think in regular best ball, you can sort of think about it in terms of like, oh, well, if I have a bunch of teams in advance, they're likely to be good teams. Maybe I want to optimize a little more for week 17. Maybe I want to optimize more for advance rates. But in this case, there is a very clear like binary shutoff in which point you can have a 100% advance rate. You can advance all of your teams if you play like 20 teams or whatever, and they could all literally be dead, like dead to winning, just completely dead. And I think that's where, Pat, you, you were talking about. There are some things that are not nearly as intuitive in this as they are in like, oh, just get good players and get them to the final round. You could have the best player. McCaffrey could score 100 points in five, what, three consecutive games or whatever. If he doesn't win and get in at the end, you could still be dead. Yeah, the uh, I think what you said about the binary nature is really important. I, I think a real easy thought exercise to do for this is pretend that there's a magic player and he scores 1 million points every week, but you know that his team is guaranteed to not make the Super Bowl. That player, I mean, yes, he's valuable because he gets you to the Super Bowl, but he's really, he's not all that valuable because he doesn't score any points in the week that actually matters. And we don't, in real life, we don't have the confidence that a player is going to score a million points. And so the way that I actually like to attack this structure is not just what two teams are making the Super Bowl. I think the best approach to take is what four teams are going to be in the conference championship in this specific iteration that I'm drafting for. And so that's really the way that you want to do the bracketology and the thinking through in your individual drafts is what four teams have the highest probability of making the conference championship. This form of best ball is the least important for players that it, it could ever be that the individual players that you draft mean almost nothing except for you know don't go drafting like a bunch of guys that project for sub five points every week you know um it, it really comes down to what teams are your players on and what is the probability of those teams making it to the conference championship round so let me just back up real quick on the you guys referenced the five you know fielding a full five so the roster for these tournaments is one quarterback one running back two wide receivers slash tight end and one flex. So there's your five. There's also five bench spots. So to get to the Super Bowl with five players alive from those two teams, you do have the potential to, you know, have lost half your team, but you still need to have, you need to have the ability to field a full lineup in order to have like a realistic chance of taking it down. Um, although may, maybe not if the field isn't, but you know, there's still there's still going to be teams that are uh, that have full rosters, and you're basically dead to to those teams. So you want to be in that bucket of you say eight. There was only eight of these teams last year. Yeah, yeah. you want to be and one the of those. Final eight. was one fifty full, one hundred and fifty seven. Right? Yeah. yeah, there should be a lot more than eight this year, but you want to be in that bucket 
because yeah, those teams are are they're not only are uh, they're going to block you, right? You're going to have the literally the same players that those teams have minus one or two. They just and have so an extra just, flex guy. They just get to play your lineup, yeah. but then they have the optionality of one guy scores one point immediately scores more than you, and you yeah. have no way to surpass him. So it's not like you have this like unrealistic out. Like you are dead. You are dead. Yeah, you yeah. Have exactly. to get there. That's, that's a weird thing to think about. You're not. Oh, I'm a long shot to win. But if this one weird thing happens, no. When you don't have five, when you can't fill fill the full roster, someone ahead of you will have you blocked plus one. And it's there's no outs for you. You can show up to the final round, and a ton of teams do show up to the final round. With no chance of zero. Do you yeah, have that for, handy sack? I, like there was an incredible amount, I, like a mind blowing number of teams showed up to the final so last many. year with like zero live play. There were there were 40, 40 players or forty teams in the last gauntlet last year that had zero live players in the finals. <laughs> Uh, a quarter were... of the team for like imagine a DFS thing where a quarter of the of the entries they forgot to hit submit yep. they reserve and their never lineup. hit they never hit their lineup yeah. and that's what this breaks down to and then there's a bunch of uh, a bunch more teams that they put one player in their lineup and they're they're tying for the next right group, spots one ten through one thirty or whatever it is yeah I I, I want to go through these numbers for the finals and then also what the overall field looks like even from the outset uh, just to kind of illustrate the edge that's available in this format i'll tell you guys this is the reason i started playing best ball at volume i had been playing best ball for a few years for fun you know I, I started doing the mfl 10s way back in the day and you know did did a little bit on DraftKings because i knew the competition was soft didn't really get into underdog until this year because i had heard um and, and last year for playoff best ball i heard oh, all the sharp people draft over at underdog and i'm I'm really an advantage player at heart and I don't want to play games against the good competition. Like let me play the weakest players if they're willing to play me for money. And so I just want to illustrate like what this field is that you're up against, because it was enough to get me to max enter the gauntlet, play a lot of other playoff contests. And I'm coming back for a heaping helping of seconds this year. So <laughs> um, in the finals last year, 40 teams had zero live players. No one on the, in the actual Super Bowl. 24 teams had one live player. Uh, and I will tell you a large number of those were Marquez Valdez Scantling, uh, <laughs> which uh, I have to have my hand up on that one. My only team that made it to the finals last year was a only Marquez Valdez Scantling as the last live player uh, on a really oh, stacked Bengals and 49ers roster, which we're going to pour some out for that one. Uh, two players rostered were on 30 teams. 39 teams had three players rostered, 13 had four players rostered, and nine had five rostered, but without a quarterback on one of them. So only eight total teams with the ability to field a full five-man roster. And it gets better. It's Now, that's a little weird because it was two first-round bye teams that made the Super Bowl last year. So it's a lot harder. You got to run really pure to get five through to the Super Bowl round in that kind of scenario. So unless we get two first round buy teams in the Super Bowl again this year, you're going to see those numbers up substantially for how many teams are actually live in the finals. But just out of the gate, almost 22% of the field is not even drafting a roster that can field five players in the Super Bowl. It's literally impossible. They don't have a combination of players on teams. That what percent did you say? Team. What percent of the field is doing 22%. That's like 22% so, of teams that are locked out of first through probably 10th, like dead, completely dead to first through 10th, which is like a massive chunk of the prize and pool, I, a massive chunk. I, I would say in normal years where we don't get two first, uh, first True, round yeah. buy teams in there, you're looking at like those teams that, that can't field more than say four. I mean, four would be very optimistic, right? You're probably looking at like two to three on average for these teams that draft literal dead teams. Um, they're they're maybe looking at like a 50th to 100th place finish and that's their best case scenario which if you make it to the finals and you get into the top 100 you're going home with a thousand bucks based on last year's payout structure so it's not the worst thing in the world but when you look at the expected value calculation and and you just chop off the top part of the payout structure and you just say i'm gonna preclude myself from being live for any of that you should not play the contest. You you will be a losing player over time. Like 
provably mathematically that's that's the best thing about this yeah. contest is it's so much less about player takes it's so much more about the math and the game theory and as long as you pay attention to that stuff you're going to have a massive edge over the majority of people playing this i just want to underline this idea because it's reminiscent of week 17 correlation and you know this is this is a group that pushes the idea that week 17 correlation is important but i would say this is really not that similar because like in in the example of week 17 correlation right you're building a team and then you're going to pull this lever that increases your equity in the final rounds potentially you know maybe you're you're like sacrificing theoretically some advance rate edge i don't necessarily think so but maybe let's say you let's say you are for argument's sake well you know getting there is still important and you can show up to the week 17 final with a team that isn't correlated and theoretically take the, take down the whole thing that does not preclude you from winning. It's just like a, a, a little way that we can add a little bit of, of EV to our lineups. This is not that this is not, there's, I think this, like when I've drafted these in previous years, there's this feeling of like, well, I got to get there. I know it's important to get five in the super bowl, but like you got to get there for the, no, if you do not have five in the super bowl, turn on, turn off your phone. <laughs> Like you're not, you're not going to get, you're not going to win first at that point. You will not win first that you, yeah. you can't, you won't, you, you don't have enough players. So it's just like so much more. It's not like a small lever we're pulling. It is truly it's like 80% of things. the levers. There's a bunch of levers on the board and they all have the same label. Get a bunch of players to the final. And then there's a few others. That yeah. Like I went with this wide receiver three over this wide receiver four or whatever. And that's, about but it's it. like not it's drafting a quarterback in regular yeah, baseball. Yeah. Like it's like like not drafting a quarterback. I mean, I think that's as, it's as fundamental of a mistake as that because you are completely dead to win first place. Where like you could have the most completely uncorrelated team in BBM three and and BBM or BBM four, whatever, and win the whole tournament. You would be live. This is not. This is this is a different thing, and I think. There's something, you know, as you're drafting these where you're like, yeah, but I got to get to the Super Bowl. So <laughs> and you're kind of I think even though it's that much more important, the field is going to be fighting against this impulse to just get there, which which is a bad which is an impulse you really want to fight against. I want to. Yeah. I want to. Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, all the sayings that we use, you know, in our week seventeen conspiracy theory groups when we meet in the basement to talk about <laughs> the five to ten percent correlation edges, all those things matter orders of magnitude more here. When Pat and I over the summer talked about thinking of the best ball playoffs as a satellite tournament, that's more a theory to understand it where you want to be optimizing for the final week and you have to get through the regular season and then two other playoff weeks in the process. This is the biggest satellite tournament ever. If you do not have a full roster in the end, you're not going to win the prizes. And if you're not trying to win the prizes, you might as well like touch grass, talk to your family, but you shouldn't be playing playoff basketball. Right. I I want to touch on uh, what Pat said about, oh, you got to get there first, because one thing that I've seen lots of people talk about is, well, I'm going to draft, you know, these players that are on big underdogs in the first round of the playoffs. You know, sometimes you can get a great player. Like, for example, last season, you could have gotten Tyree Kill last round of the draft because no one thought the Dolphins were going to advance. Right. Um, same with like DK Metcalf and, and DK Metcalf did end up going off uh, in the first round last year dk was the highest scoring wide receiver he put up 30 fantasy points but the point that i want to make here is number one the dk metcalf teams may have advanced but dk metcalf was dead dk metcalf is scoring you zero points every round after that first round and so while it might feel good to see oh well i had those dk metcalf teams and they advanced because i drafted dk metcalf it, it actually doesn't matter as much as you think it does because that team is now weaker for you having DK Metcalf on the team, just losing that one roster spot matters significantly. And you have to take into consideration for every DK Metcalf that you picked, you also picked a Tyreek Hill who only scored 12 points in the fantasy playoffs last year before he was eliminated. You also took a Keenan Allen who only scored nine points before he was eliminated. You also took, I mean, this one's kind of an extreme one, but uh, this is probably the best illustration of why I love playoff best ball. Justin Jefferson was going super early last year in playoff best ball. 
And the Vikings did not have a snowball's chance in hell of making the Super Bowl, right? It just was not possible. They were frauds. They were frauds. Yeah. And, and Justin Jefferson was going super early the whole time. Well, we, round one of the playoffs comes. Justin Jefferson puts up eight points. So not only does he not help you advance, he's now a dead roster spot too because the Giants upset the Vikings. And so really what I want to illustrate is, number one, you don't know who is going to score the most points in any of these given weeks, right? Whatever degree of confidence you have in that, throw it out the window. And, and who, sure, maybe you are right you know, an above average amount of the time. Even if you're right, if that player's team doesn't make it to the conference championship round, it doesn't matter. It hurt your equity overall. And just to illustrate this, let's say hypothetically, every DK Metcalf team advanced. 100% of the teams that actually drafted DK Metcalf advanced. And he wasn't drafted in 100% of drafts, but you show up to the next round, all these DK Metcalf teams have a dead slot. You now, if you were not a DK Metcalf drafter, have such a large advantage over all these other teams because the number of combinations you can field in this specific structure with only 10 total roster spots and five starting roster spots is very small compared to what we can for regular best ball. And just that one dead roster spot is going to matter a whole heck of a lot, especially as you progress through the tournament. So that was... Uh, one, one thing you noted... Uh, before we start is that the tiebreaker for because you can tie in these pods you have to advance each tournament slightly different you know it'd be like you one of six uh of the original six teams you drafted then like one of ten or one of eight or whatever you get through but the scores are close enough and the the number of combinations are small enough that you actually do see ties and you're noting that the tiebreaker is the highest scoring bench player so in some ways like you know You'll just have an extra flex position the more the every once in a while. If you draft 150 teams, a few of those will have one week where functionally an extra flex spot showed up. An extra flex spot. You yeah. did you did a, a Chiefs stack that advanced. They they play in the first round, score a bunch of points, and then you a bunch of Chiefs stacks advance, and then you face a bunch of Chiefs stacks in your next pod or in the pod after that. You guys are all just starting Pacheco, Mahomes, Kelsey, and like a, a Rasheed Rice or whatever. You're basically fielding the same lineup. So there will be points in the game at which, especially if you're drafting a bunch of teams and there will be points for like people we know where you totally tie and you just are forced to essentially have one week where there's an extra flex spot added specifically your team in your pod. Right. Yeah. Right. And to go back so, to Zach's point when he was identifying the DK Metcalf, the Keenan Allen, the Tyreek Hill, and possibly even the Justin Jefferson, if you were that confident in the Vikings being frauds, which was probably a good idea. This is just a bad forest to be looking for the one 30 point one mm -hmm. week one tree. Not only are those trees not going to help you get to the Super Bowl, you're also probably going to misidentify the tree so often that it hurts you in two ways. So just go for the teams that you think, or if you don't trust your ability that much, or have the humility to look at betting markets or other data driven resources to look at what are the teams that people or the markets have identified as most likely to get to the conference championship and build from there. Yes. So I think uh, this is a, a good transition for us to actually pull up some odds. So this is from Sumer Sports. And I, you know, one of the ideas here, it's kind of like in DFS with ownership in terms of how much uh, the field is going to be on all of these different plays but we feel better about our, our ability to project what people are going to do in these games than what the players will do on the field. And so that, you know, that's one of the, the fundamentals of, of DFS, right? This is the idea of which of these teams, at least the way these, these, um, these tournaments are being drafted right now, there's such a discrepancy sometimes between uh, the way we expect these teams to advance through the NFL playoffs and the ADP for these tournaments. And we have a lot more confidence on which of these teams are going to make the playoffs than, you know, which of these random players on, you know, the, the wild card teams are going to actually score points in one game. So if you're, you're building your teams to reflect, first of all, the playoff odds, like, in the early tournaments, the Bills were, you know, 
I mean, they're they're down to 20th now in playoff odds, but the Bills were pretty shaky for a long time, and their ADPs were really, really high. Like Daniel and I were looking at some of the early stuff, kind of putting together our plan. <laughs> it's like, uh, the like basically we just shouldn't be drafting Bills. Uh, and you know, that was that was right. Like those guys, those ADPs were so egregiously high relative to their chances of making the playoffs. So that's one way to look at it. I think also the way we want to be thinking about as the teams who can actually make the Super Bowl, that being a, a huge part of this, as Sack was saying, we're trying to build out a conference championship. So selecting the four teams we think are going to make the conference championship, drafting with that in mind, and the odds of those teams actually being able to do that is so much more important than uh, our, you know, our desire to pick, you know, that really fun sleeper guy that's going to absolutely blow up in round one. Yeah, Pat, and to your point, we can like literally see, we, we don't even have to, to some degree, predict what our opponents are doing. Underdog gives us the ADP. Imagine if you're building DFS lineups and it's telling you exactly what percent of players are drafting, you know, Justin Jefferson with, or, you know, in this case, spending their, their cap for Justin Jefferson. And we are literally in drafts watching people make their lineups. You're peeking over their shoulder. We can see <laughs> exactly what they're doing and then compare that with the odds of a team making the Super Bowl, making the conference title. We know what the field is doing to a very strong degree. We just have some minor margins. Like we can't tell exactly how much they're stacking, but we can have a good idea of who the field thinks is going to the conference championships, thinks is going to the Super Bowl, and then we can compare that with, like, I don't want to say reliable, but like good simulated odds of what's happening. And we can immediately spot, like you said, a team like the Bills or previously the Bengals, who are just clearly, or last year, the, the Vikings, specifically Justin Jefferson, and spot clearly what the field is doing incorrectly based on the actual odds of teams making deep playoff runs. Yeah, and to give some clarity to people that weren't in these contests on the first few opening days in the first week, Jamar Chase and Stefan Diggs were one, two turn picks. So that is in this tournament, ADPs of six and seven because it's only six person drafts. And at that point, the Bengals and Bills both had around 50% odds to make the playoffs. If I'm being generous, obviously the Bengals lost Joe Burrow and are drawing dead and the Bills are an unlikely playoff team. But the field sometimes just really wants to look at the names and like, oh, that's a first round pick in season long best ball. They're healthy. They're a fun offense. But then it's like, oh, they're almost certainly not going to make the playoffs. They're like MVS is scoring points. more points in the playoffs the moment he catches his first pass after three drops because he Which made the playoffs. Yes, yes, exactly. And just I, I think more to the point, much more likely to score points in the Super Bowl where all the money is. I mean, this is that week 17 thing of like all the money is in week 17, but there at least you can push back and be like yeah so what like i'm i'm just going to draft players that are good and healthy and that you know they're going to put up points in week 17 cuz everyone will be available in week 17 this is you <laughs> like there will be two teams that can put up points in the, this version of week 17 in the super bowl and you have to have those players so the second marcus Valdez scantling catches a 6 yard pass in the super bowl that that like alone is more important than you know whatever someone did in the wild card round. Yeah, and there's something we talk about in the summer that's like what we've said previously is like theory about best ball is like ideally you get to the final round and you've got really weird combinations of players that no one else has, and you're able to say like oh everyone advanced uh, everyone advanced Tyreek Hill to this year's best ball playoffs. I'd love to get a team that made it there with Travis Kelsey because in any tournament, if you have two players who, let's say they project similarly, Hill will project for more, whatever, you'd love to have uh, the the 1% owned Kelsey versus the 80% the owned Hill. Right. But actually controlling that is extremely difficult. And a lot of the ways we talk about doing it is like, oh, well, what if you like reach on two players mm -hmm. at the 1-2 turn so you give up a ton of projected points or at least a reasonable amount of projected points to get, quote, like the unique combo so you can get to the final round and have, quote, leverage. Like that sounds great in theory, but to what point how do you push that? It's difficult to say. It's really not difficult to say in this contest because you can very easily craft teams that you you look at them and say, oh, yeah, I get to the final round and I have massive equity and I didn't give up anything to get there because I also had a bunch of guys who were playing in all of their games up until that point and I made it with a team that can field a flex spot, can field its quarterback, and that's how you easily build like uniqueness and, quote, combos into your lineups 
in ways that we don't really have to speculate on, like, is it even worth it? We can look at the numbers and know getting a full roster there, obviously worth it. Yeah, remember how I'll quickly just there are only 14 teams that make the playoffs, so there are only 13 games. One champion is my math right, or are there 14 games? Either way, there aren't that many games. If you just make a few levers and say when you're building a team, oh, if the Lions and Ravens win out and I just optimize for that game tree and build five or so teams with just Lions and Ravens, you then have the potential to capture the unique Lions-Ravens with as many possible players. And you can also then use Sack's ideas with picking the other two teams that make the conference championship. There aren't that many things to control for in this. So you want to be thinking about how you can maximize your edge with the levers available to pull. Yeah, I, I want to go back to comparing this to the Week 17 conversation. Remember how last year the Bills and Bengals game got canceled in Week 17? And sure, some of those players, I think, scored a couple points or whatever. I'm but familiar, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this This is that, but every game gets canceled. Yeah, imagine, imagine if you could like guess which games get canceled. <laughs> it's all the games they get canceled. There's just one. Well, that's a good, way to, that's a good way to put it, yeah. And, and so <laughs> what we're trying to do is use probability to help drive our decisions. And we've got at least a halfway decent shot at, at knowing and understanding what these probabilities are to help us figure out which is the game that doesn't get canceled. That's yeah, kind imagine of Pat sitting that. there. When did you draft that team, Pat? Was that like a July, early July team or what was it? Yeah, that? it was July 18th. Yeah, imagine July 18th, Pat sitting there and he's thinking, well, like, of course, these are some good players not, but let's play for the scenario in which this game gets canceled. Except imagine if that actually made sense because there are right now as we sit here, I'm sure like technically like <laughs> millions of possible combinations of that final game, but we know for sure Minus one, every one of those possible games that could be played in the Super Bowl will get canceled. Yeah. So let me pull up the ADP um, of the wild card right now. This is underdogs playoff ADP. Does anyone jump out here? Um, should I? Tyree Kill. Tyree Kill uh, has, let's see, let me go back to playoff odds. The Dolphins have a 16.5% chance of making the conference final, 6%, 7% chance of making the Super Bowl, and Tyreek Hill is the second highest drafted player. Does that jump out as potentially an issue, or is he just so good that we're just drafting Dolphins to the Super Bowl teams? Thoughts it's, on that? It's probably ever so slightly inefficient, but I will tease something uh, that we're, we've got in the works. Um, the optionality that Tyree Kill provides based mm. on a little bit of uh, fun under the hood math we've got going on here is very good. Um, and so that can actually drive a player up or down in the rankings as well. And I do want to just touch on one ADP uh, just kind of big picture thing here. And this is, I'm, I'm probably talking to like 10 total people who are going to be like, oh my gosh, that helped me so much. But three of them are on the show. For you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for you 10 out there, this is for you. The, the real hardcore BR and daily underdog grinders out there, the sickos that like track all of their combinations and track what their opponents are getting and like how ADP moves and everything. A, a lot of people that play the games that seriously and focus on combinations and roster combinatorics um, really are, are trying to find those inefficiencies in the market and then exploit it and get a combination that's unique. So I got Tyree Kill at the second pick and then, oh my gosh, I got super lucky and Lamar Jackson fell all the way back to me and I got Tyree Kill Lamar Jackson combo. Crazy. Never thought it would happen. I've got news for you. In playoff basketball, the market is so volatile and the contest is open for a decent amount of time that the unique combos thing actually just goes out the window. And that's, it makes me sad because I'm, I'm those people, you know, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. So, so take that part of your brain, set it aside for the dailies and the, you know, the battle Royales. It really matters there for playoff basketball. It doesn't matter. So don't, trick yourself or delude yourself into thinking, oh, wow, I got a crazy faller here and it's a great unique combo with this player. What's a unique combo this week by next week might be the chalk because the playoff odds change. Everything is fluid and dynamic. And so I would just caution against drafting specifically for a unique combo and focus much more on 
building solid teams where you're building around a four team possibility of these four teams make the conference championships. It doesn't mean you have players from those four teams all on your roster. You might only have two teams or three teams, or you may have all four, but that's, that's really what I wanted to hit on with ADP. Yeah. The unique combo we're looking for is a starting lineup. We're trying to get a starting lineup into the final round because that literally was extremely unique last year. What eight of eight of one fifty? So like, what is that like five percent i don't know somewhere in the ballpark of like a 20th of the teams were able to field a full lineup that is extremely unique and it's, it's like our de facto replacement for unique combos in this contest does anyone jump out to you guys it's like uh we'll obviously dive deeper into the adp versus you know what we think a more uh efficient market would look like uh, in, in the future, but does anyone kind of just jump out at a high level of that something that seems off to give people a, a better sense of kind of our philosophy on this? Initially, when I was looking, I thought Lamar was a, a tad underpriced. And uh, can you scroll up a little bit? There were, uh, I thought Kelsey was maybe a touch overpriced as well. And this is so Kelsey is kind of a relic of people being stuck in normal best ball brain because in you know, battle Royales and in, you know, season long best ball, Kelsey's a tight end and he's so much better than all the other tight ends, you know, as far as his projection in a given week that he's just a cheat code. Right. But in this Kelsey is a wide receiver. All the tight ends have the same exact tag for a position as a wide receiver. And so Kelsey loses a lot of his luster there. Will he still project like some of the top wide receivers? Absolutely. But now the Kelsey Mahomes going back to back is probably just a feature of those two guys being the one to turn pick. You get Kelsey Mahomes, you're super happy. Um, but what I would say is I'm probably looking at this as in the event that I'm going to be building some chief stuff. And if I feel like, I guess this is probably what I'm going to do more near the end of the life cycle of the contest. But if Kelsey Mahomes stay at this one, two turn, and that is an absolute chalk combo, like I'm seeing everyone who gets Kelsey get Mahomes and vice versa. That's actually one where I would finally get to be my unique combo nerd and say, <laughs> ha I'm actually not going to take Travis Kelsey. I'm going to take Patrick Mahomes, and then I'm going to take the best wide receiver or best running back that could play opposite him in the Super Bowl. And then I'm going to load up on the cheaper Chiefs pieces later. Um, so I know I just got off my soapbox about don't worry about you. But this is, a, this is a tactic you would use with the knowledge of this has been chalk the entire tournament. The tournament's about to close. And so now I'm going to leverage that. that and, and, and knowing that Kelsey is specifically to Kelsey. overpriced. Yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's also a tactic right. specific to Kelsey right. because he's just a wide receiver here. And like on like just on average points, like he really shouldn't hang out anywhere near Tyree Killer, CD Lamb in terms of just like the points they're scoring because he's uh, he's tight end. He's not scoring as many points. I'd be interested to see how the uh, Jags ADP shake out because people are going to love drafting their Dolphins because the Dolphins score a bunch of points and are fun. Mm -hmm. But like they're very very similar odds to especially make the conference title. Sumer Sports has them with about three percent different odds at making the conference title and just about two percent of making a Super Bowl. But the the dolphins are more predictable and they score more points so they will go higher but how much higher should they go my guess is the, the field is going to overrate how much higher they should go because at the end of the day like average points don't matter again we're trying to get these live teams to make it to the final rounds that's the most thing we are the, the function we're trying to optimize for it's great that tyree kill scores a lot of points he scores a lot of points and loses it won't matter and if the and if the jags have some like mediocre low scoring advance but advancing in the playoffs wins you can still show up with those teams to the super bowl to the conference championship and have the tyree kill teams that got dusted in the wild card round completely dead yeah so I, can so i nominate yeah. can i nominate jameer gibbs as a potential overdrafted player go go yes. back to the lions playoff odds real quick So the Lions have a 7% chance of making oh, yeah. the conference championship and a 3% chance of making the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah so I they're just, really, yeah. I just ran my playoff ADP model, which is pretty basic, but I had, as Kyle was talking about, Tyree Kill as the worst pick in the first round. I feel like he should be an early second round pick, and I have Gibbs as a one to two round overdrafted player, but that might not even be enough. I would agree that 
the model isn't capturing everything I'd like it to. But yeah, Gibbs overdrafted, Hill overdrafted, Jaguars underdrafted. Pretty. To Pat's so, point previously is that like my intuition also is that like is that the Lions would have had a far better chance of making the conference title, making the Super Bowl. Then you pull up someone's simulations and they have them as a seven percent chance, like significantly lower than the Jaguars. To that's make just the of the conference title. championship. Yeah, that's just yeah. for the conference championship alone. And like, had you had I not had access, had I not Googled like you know summer sports playoff model, I would have been like, yeah, I guess Gibbs does make sense. He scores points. He's good. And the Lions are a really good team, but. I mean, it's probably a function of, like, shockingly, the NFC has turned out to be really... They're definitely the better conference this year, right? They seem like having the Eagles and having the juggernaut 49ers, like, they seem to be the less flawed conference and the Cowboys getting hot. So, I yeah, the Lions yeah, are probably... The Lions are probably... I mean, they are pretty big dogs to make the conference title, really big dogs to make the Super Bowl, yet we can see Jameer Gibbs with an ADP like this. So, yeah, I mean, this, I know this is going to sound extremely gross, but like Jameer Gibbs and David Montgomery versus Gus Edwards and Keaton Mitchell. Yeah, these like, are the Gus sick Edwards. Conversations was, you should yeah. be having. These are the sick conversations like, you should be having. Don't Gus and Keaton actually have more valuable, more value than Gibbs and Montgomery based on everything we've talked about? Yeah, Gus Edwards is one of the ones that I saw initially where I was like, this is one of the worst priced players in the whole. ADP, he should be going a lot earlier. And I get it. It's gross. Like him and Keaton Mitchell, it's not super predictive. Who's who's going to be the one that gets the touches? And is he even going to score very many points? But I tell you what, you flip over the cards and it's Raven Super Bowl and you have either of those guys, you're doing cartwheels. It doesn't matter if they score two points in the Super Bowl. The fact that they are live like, is, is so, so, so valuable. So yeah, Gus Edwards... I'm sad that we're blowing up this spot. I wanted them to drop the gauntlet, and have the, the Ravens be horribly yeah. mispriced. Well, sorry. Yeah, I know. We're we're supposed to be teased. There's plenty more. There's plenty more. <laughs> but I mean, it is kind of the thing. I mean, just thinking about like the the Ravens are over three times as likely than the Lions per the Sumer Sports odds. And, you know, there, there's other versions of this, but some version of this is super important to thinking through these contests. Uh this has them as over three times likely to make the Super Bowl. So, you know, it's Jameer Gibbs like three times more likely to. Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of a crazy thing because it's like it's not even just once you make the Super Bowl, those points are then in, like infinitely more valuable than whatever points. So it's not. It's like Jameer Gibbs could outscore Keaton Mitchell could by three x, by five x, by six x, whatever. Yeah. If all and that it's... comes in the first two rounds and those teams all die off, wither yes. on the vine as the Lions get knocked out in the the second round of the playoffs, it would not have mattered how many points they outscore Keaton Mitchell by or whatever. Keaton Mitchell drops six in the Super Bowl, few catches or whatever. Those teams are crushing it that made it there, and the teams that made it there with Lions, they scored no points. It didn't matter, and we care most about getting first place, getting top five. There is this thing of like, if Jameer Gibbs plays two games and Keaton Mitchell makes the conference championship, but then gets knocked out, then like maybe at that point you could, you could say, actually, you'd rather have had Gibbs, but you are playing, you're playing for these teams to make the conference championship. And then that therefore will make sure you have enough players to advance to the Super Bowl. So let's, let's like kind of go back up a, a little bit higher level and just talk about how many teams are you looking to draft? Like you could draft two teams and just play for a Super Bowl. Obviously you'd want one from the AFC, one from the NFC in that scenario. You could draft three, you could draft four. I don't think we want to be drafting more than four, but I'd be curious if, if there's any exceptions to that. But basically if you're drafting a conference championship, there's only four teams there. So somewhere between two and four teams, uh, I'm I'm guessing is going to be our our target, but thoughts on how to play that, um, you know, between the two and four. Yeah, two two to four is optimal. You don't really want to be really. I, I it's pretty cut and dry. You're you're between two and four. Here's a Galbrain one though. If if you want to just be the absolute sickest sicko out there, you technically could draft two five player stacks from teams from the same conference. And, and say that I'm calling my shot on oh, the wow. conference championship and I'm I'm getting, you know, I mean, it's not really going to be possible, most likely with the ADPs, right? 
Um, and you would also then have to draft two quarterbacks if that's your strategy, unless you're just, you know, picking the winner and you're saying, Hey, I'm getting five with one quarterback. And then my other one is five and they're going to die in the conference championship. I don't think you ever actually want to do that, but for anyone out there, that's like really disturbed and wants to just, that seems like something we could do if the field was way sharper. Yeah. You could kind of like pull that lever of like, I'm actually going to now predict this a little bit more uniquely. Yeah. Because you definitely wouldn't have that combo occurring in the tournament very much. And so in the event that the DK Metcalf of that year, the Saquon Barkley of that year existed on one of those two teams that you drafted. Yeah. You could end up with a really interesting uh, combination, but yeah, I I'm for most of my teams, they're going to be probably three team builds. Um, Some will, some will be four and some will be two, but it's going to be kind of a a distribution with three being the the normal uh, base rate that I'm looking at. And then I'm kind of like diverging to two or four based on what happens in the draft room. Um, This is something where I know that a lot of people during, you know, normal regular season best ball don't pay quite as much attention to the board and the room and like what your opponents are doing. I got to tell you, if you're one of those people, that's not a, not a pay attentioner and you're just kind of autopiloting through your stuff, this ain't the contest pass on it. It's not the contest for you. You got to pay attention. You got to know what the room is doing. You got to see what teams people are stacking up and you want to identify the rational drafters and the irrational drafters in your room. The rational drafters are your favorite people to draft with, even though they're the Mm -hmm. strongest competition in the tournament, they're also not going to screw you for the most part by getting out of their lane and taking valuable players that are in your stack. um, Unless it really makes sense for them. And guess what? If they're a rational drafter, you can tell when it makes sense for them and you'll know when you need to deviate uh, seriously from ADP to make sure that you're capturing the players that you really need to build out the roster construction that gives you the best team. Um, And then identifying those irrational drafters, the people who are just absolute loose cannons, like this guy just drafted his third quarterback by the fourth round. You want to you want to factor those in as well and know that you really can't plan for what that person's going to do. And you want to build in some optionality to your team. And that is to say that the player that I select should give me a lot of different players I could select next that would still give me a great team. I don't want to ever get myself into a situation where there's only one player that this is the linchpin. I need this player. If I don't have this player, my team is dead because if someone else takes that player and kills my team, I really hate having a totally stone dead team that could have been preventable. So what you really want to do is consider, well, both of these players I think are pretty similar as far as what they do for my build, their probabilities of making it to the conference championships, Um, But player A over here has lots more teammates remaining alive. Like, for example, the Ravens. That's why I really liked Lamar. There's lots of Ravens that go really late. Um, Or instead of Lamar, I could take, you know, uh, Devonta Smith or whoever goes around him there. And it's like, yeah, by the time I get Devonta Smith, like the best Eagles are gone. I'm probably not getting very many more attractive Eagles. I'm like picking Julio Jones later or something. (laughs) And And so at that point, you'd rather just say, you know what, I'd love to have some Eagles exposure, but this ain't the draft to do it. I'm going to take Lamar because a lot of crazy stuff could happen in this draft, and I'm still going to come out with a really solid team because I focused on the optionality. I think that's a really underrated part. And so paying attention to your room, thinking through the optionality each pick gives you um, is really, really critical. Let me go off that just go, to go. add on an analogy that I find helpful. If you were to get on a highway, you're driving and you see all five other cars pretty easily are saying, I'm staying in my own lane. So then you start your lane, CD Lamb, Tony Pollard, Travis Etienne, and you're pretty comfortable. Every driver is like, I have a lane. I'm not going to try and converge in your lane. You then feel very comfortable about the teams you can create. And while simultaneously you creating an optimal team may help other drafters also have optimal teams because you can have one draft room where there are six plus EV teams created. It's a very unique feature to this tournament where if you got a bunch of sharp people and obviously no collusion or anything, but everyone is playing the game optimally, everyone will be better off. And you then can plan on building different teams than if you see someone open Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, and then you have to adjust your prior for, oh, someone's swerving recklessly Mm -hmm. into everyone's lane. Right. Yeah, that's so. One of the things I think is 
is important to touch on is that this tournament is, you know, we exist in a reality that is only going to play out once in one specific way. And we're talking about things that's like, you know, Zach, you're saying you're probably maybe going to be underweight Devontae Smith, hypothetically, at this ADP, right, because of the way it's shaking out. There is this, you know, potential issue, right, if you're trying to, like, how do you want to play these games? Do you want to just take the guy who gives you the most optionality, take the Ravens, because, you know, you can you can build around that Raven? Well, the Ravens are either going to go to the Super Bowl or they aren't. And so you can build all the plus EV Ravens teams you want based on, you know, this, this ADP environment, um, based on, you know, their ADPs relative to their chances of making the Super Bowl, et cetera, et cetera. But you could also walk away with nothing in the in these tournaments or very, very little if it kind of doesn't play out that way. So how are you guys thinking through like balancing that element of like, you know, I'm my Devontae Smith teams are kind of weaker or my Eagles teams are kind of weaker than my Ravens teams, but do I want to just say, fine, then this year I'm going to be super leveraged uh, on the Eagles not making the Super Bowl. And if they do, I, I'm just not going to win this tournament. Or are you trying to kind of diversify your your realities a little bit? I'll tell you what I did for last season. And I'm, I've am i done a little more research between last season and now, so I feel like I'm a better informed drafter. But last season... I got really aggressive with the ambiguity surrounding who was going to get the buy in the AFC. It was Chiefs, Bills, right? No one really knew who was getting that buy. And so what I saw pretty much every team doing in my drafts was if they went with either the Chiefs or the Bills and they took a quarterback, they drafted a second quarterback because they were scared. Oh, gosh, well, if, if the Bills get the buy, I'm dead with Josh Allen as my quarterback. And I went the other way and I said, I'll kill half my teams. I'm going to kill half of my Chiefs teams or half of my Bills teams. But the other ones are going to be extremely strong relative to the other Bills or Chief teams that are existing in this tournament. So I only drafted single quarterback versions of those teams, single quarterback Bills or single quarterback Chiefs. And sure enough, you know, all my Mahomes teams were dead, which was not a great outcome for last season. <laughs> But I still, I made a very small profit last year with nuking all of my Chiefs stuff, basically. You know, all the ones that had Mahomes on them anyway. I had some where I had Chiefs as my secondary option. Um, and, and that's really the point I want to get across is this contest is so soft. This is the easiest game you will play for money. Um, if you understand the strategy, your opponents are so bad that you can very, very reasonably break even or not lose a ton by taking these extremely aggressive, exploitative strategies. And that's the way that I want to play it in the current marketplace and environment. While your competition's bad, swing for the fences. Because even when you miss here, there's a bunch of people that aren't even showing up to their at bat. You know, there's 22% of the teams <laughs> that are dead before the contest gets started. And so, you know, they're, they're sitting in their, you know, on deck circle, taking their practice swings and they get called up to the plate and dudes just like staring out at, you know, center field or something, not paying attention to what's going on. And I'm saying, Hey, at least let me get up to the plate. I'm going to take a couple hacks at, you know, some high cheese, but I'm at least swinging for it. Right. And so what I want to do is really focus on exploiting the market at each different interval. And so you'll see lots of changes in ADPs every week as the playoff odds change and public sentiment surrounding players and teams change. Uh, and that's really the way that I think is the best way to build a portfolio in this. It's not to get to that totally balanced, I've got 8% of everyone, or I guess in this place, in this tournament, you'd have 16% of everyone because it's only 16 drafts, but you, you don't wanna go flat in this type of game. Um, I, I think you want to go really exploitative, but what you're exploiting the field with is going to change each week. And so you'll end up with some diversification in your portfolio if you're playing this game thoughtfully. And, and that's the level of diversification that I'm aiming for. Whatever I get naturally is great. Um, anything in excess of that isn't necessary because the teams that I'd be building purely for diversification's sake are going to most likely be worse teams, lower expected value teams. 
And right now with how bad the field is, I don't need to do that in, you know, three years from now when we've thoroughly ruined this game and we've got mm -hmm. all the content and tools out there where it just makes it, you know, easy as clicking a button and everyone's drafting these awesome teams that are all plus EV, then yeah, we're going to do some more diversification and portfolio risk management stuff. Um, and I, I think another point that I want to make, and again, now I'm talking to like 10 total people, but if you're getting down serious volume, I'm talking like, you know, five figures or, you know, you know, good, good amount of volume on these playoff contests where you are, are like, I really would feel pretty bad if I lit $30,000 <laughs> on fire, you know, um, then maybe be pretty cognizant of your diversification and your risk management across your portfolio. You probably, if you were like, yeah, I just can't justify lighting $5,000 on fire if it goes sideways for me, then maybe you don't end up doing that really high risk approach that I did last year where I was like, Hey, all my Mahomes teams or all of my Allen teams are dead, but the ones that are alive out of those that cohort are really, really good. Um, but again, because of the payout structure of this contest and how top heavy it is, you you want those super teams. The expected value you get, you know, it, it's not a linear scale. It doesn't it doesn't trade off one for one. Like, oh, I lost twenty five dollars of EV from this team that's totally dead, and I gained twenty five over here. No, on the ones where I gained EV, I probably gained like forty or fifty dollars of EV. So it's a worthwhile trade. Uh, but just that's that's my bit about risk management and portfolios. Yeah, yeah I think I'd be more likely. Of, go ahead, go ahead. Along the lines of risk tolerance and knowing you have multiple weeks to draft, if you were to play this tournament every week early and say, I'm going to fade the one, two turn Jamar Chase and Steph Diggs when the Bills and Bengals are not guaranteed playoff spots, but the market is guaranteeing them playoff spots, you can then wait, let the information come to you. And then if it's week 17, about the playoffs are about to start. And it's like, oh, look at that. The Bills and Bengals did make the playoffs, which was a risk previously unaccounted for in the market and their ADPs have not moved, you can then take it. So you're making bets at different times to maximize your portfolio. Even if their so ADPs have that. moved up somewhat, it's like they were so egregiously priced before that well, you're yeah, like, were, you'll, eat that were, you'll eat that small loss because over time yeah, you'll, you'll be stacking those, wins. Those players were picks in the top 10, so it's really tough to move up right. that much from there. So right. you're just getting free information and then design from there. So that's one of the easiest ways to diversify if you so choose. Because at the end, you're like, oh, I probably should get Jamar Chase and Steph Diggs now that they are fundamentally better picks than they were before. Yeah, I wonder if it probably makes more sense to diversify within a team in that, let's say, like, like Zach, in your position last year, I'm going to build a bunch of volatile but high expected value, uh, was it uh, Bengals and Chiefs, right? Like, there's a Bills scenario in which you draft a ton, or was it Bills and Chiefs, Bills and Chiefs, whatever. Uh, there's a scenario in which you draft a ton of Bills teams and you, once you start filtering out like, oh, I drafted them plus this NFC team. And then I drafted this one plus this NFC team where you could make it to the final round and have yourself do, you have the same five out of five live. So I'd be much more likely to exploit the market on its takes within a team. Like, let's say we get near the playoffs, Tyreek Hill still, still going as the second pick and they are projected to have a tough matchup in the first round. And you're like, there's a decent chance we just knock out the Dolphins. I'm going to full fade the Dolphins in favor of like the Ravens or something. Maybe I'm still saying like, I'm going to exploit the hell out of the field on drafting undervalued Ravens who, you know, pick your team, whoever. But the more I draft them, I'm going to keep trying to change my combinations of the available Ravens so that I don't run into a scenario in which I've duped myself essentially, which I have built these. So same I can draft Rashad together. Bateman in this. Is that what you're telling me? Buddy, you can draft Rashad Bateman until your heart's content and he's going <laughs> to score 1.2 points in the Super Bowl. And that could oh, yeah. literally make you $100,000. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna okay. You you talk me into it. I'm gonna I'm gonna be firing. Uh, so I think yeah. To to underline the the point on on um the Bills Bengals thing, right? Like the scenario that played out for Sack is that you know he drafted a bunch of awesome Chief stuff, but didn't didn't happen because they did get the buy, um, and then advancing a team through the buy when you aren't going to have a quarterback who's playing because uh, these are one quarterback teams drafted them as if they weren't going to get the buy. And then they did that. That really stinks. But in scenarios where the bills had made the super bowl, you're, I mean, I don't know if I want to, do you want to, do you want to tell people about that world sack? I'm sure you've thought about it. Oh, I mean, so my, some of my best bills teams would have, would have had like full lock on, uh, 
on the Super Bowl. Like I would have been guaranteed, you know, a top 10 finish just because I had all the live players. My actual best scenarios were uh, Bengals and 49ers with the way that last mm. year played out. I had, I want to say like seven or eight in the semifinals that were overwhelmingly uh, Bengals and 49ers. And I was sweating those games so hard. And I had a couple where I'd have like six or seven live in the Super Bowl if I got a Bengals 49ers Super Bowl with with like the nuts players too, like Christian McCaffrey, Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow, you know, very little Brock Purdy because he kept getting steamed up. It's impossible to draft Brock Purdy in the playoff <laughs> contest last year. But really was. yeah, I, I had somewhere if if those games go the other way, you're definitely looking at like the first through fifth place gauntlet winner for, <laughs> for the Cincy SF outcome. I did have a really fun little fact um, that I wanted to share about the my my totally dead Pat Mahomes teams. Believe it or not, last season, uh, I'm looking at the data for the, the gauntlet last year. There were a few one quarterback teams. It was right about 5% of the total of all of those single quarterback teams. About 5% of those would have advanced even if they had a quarterback that scored zero points. So you actually can do a, you know, that those Pat Mahomes teams weren't totally dead. You're threading an extremely thin needle. It's not something that you want to build for is like, I'm just going to have the team that hits the nuts where I got DK Metcalf and Saquon Barkley as my advanced pieces. And then I push through the full Mahomes with chief stack. Like, but you know, historically we have seen that happen around 5% of the time. So. Uh, yeah. And this is the, this is the, it's reversed from the way you would naturally think about it of like, first you have to get the, no first you have to have a, a team that's live in the Super Bowl, and then you can do weird stuff. If you want to do weird stuff, do weird stuff to try to get through round one. If you're able to sneak through one of those teams without a quarterback, which is going to be really hard. But if you do, that team all of a sudden is because those points don't matter. It's it's just you, everyone starts at zero each week. So if you somehow get that team through, all of a sudden you're you're like really, really strong. I'm gonna I'm gonna share some alpha here that you're gonna be immediately upset with me for sharing. Uh, well, then don't. <laughs> no, don't do I'm it. Doing it. Um, no, just this put it in a... chat. Put it in chat. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. This this is a cool one, and uh, I think there's enough nuance to it that we'll be able to provide a little more insight to subs in future content surrounding it. But this is one of, to to emphasize Pat's point of you need to build your your five that are going to be live in the Super Bowl, and then you can do weird stuff. The weird stuff doesn't even have to be that weird. For example, say that I build five for a bye week team. And so I've got my bye week quarterback. And, and all of a sudden I'm like, okay, I got I have to take a second quarterback here because I'm not going to be as big an idiot as Sack was last year and light a bunch of my entries on fire just for the sake of you know praying that this team doesn't get the bye, right? Um, what you do in that scenario to get weird is you're actually looking for an underdog team where you can get one of the stronger offensive weapons. This is the only instance in the whole game where individual player projection starts to matter. Um, and it's kind of weird because it, it's almost like a little, it's like a polarization of the way that the strategy works. But so you get your, your five players that are on your buy team. And so you're looking to thread a needle. Well, then you take an underdog team that you think has a chance at getting an upset in the first round of the playoffs, and you should be drafting a quarterback stacked with one of the best pass catching weapons on that team, uh, explicitly not the running back. Um, you really want it to be stacked with a wide receiver or tight end, but doing that with players that would go undrafted or relatively low drafted is one of the best ways, in my opinion, to get weird. And it's, you're not getting that weird, dude. You're taking like, you know, let's just say hypothetically that last year the that DK. Which Metcalf conference game, are you doing this relative to your quarterback? Uh, you could actually do it from either. It, it it's fine. It's uh, I'll, I'll save some of the nuanced stuff. We're, that's that's part where we'll we'll save the rest of that alpha. Okay. Um, but I, I do think that's a, a pretty valuable part to it as well. Uh, but you could do it from both. But how you do it from both really matters. Um, and if you do it wrong, your team sucks. And if you do it well, your teams are really, really good when it hits. Um, that's my favorite part is the levers that you pull in this game have such asymmetric payoffs when you get 
when you pulled the right lever, the payoff is so, so ludicrous that as long as you understand all the levers, which we'll do a really good job providing that in all of our premium content, you're going to understand this game on a level that you wish that you didn't by the time you're done uh, <laughs> digesting all of our content. Because I've got to tell you, I'm truly a disturbed individual. And not only <laughs> have I spent like all of my free time thinking about this game. Like when we were all thinking about regular season best ball, I still was doing playoff best ball math and figuring out how to optimize for it and pulling all the different levers and diving into the data. So like I got the levers down pat and we're going to, we're going to explain them all to you. And my favorite part is just how rewarded you get for pulling the correct lever. It's so, so different than normal best ball where sick. I pulled the right lever. I got the, you know, Tyler Algier, Zach Ertz game stack that I was supposed to get. And it's like, dang, I, it didn't actually, it almost hit, but it didn't quite hit. But in this game, when the lever hits, it's like, and I won all the money sick. Like I, I won literally all the money. Um, so yeah, it's my, my favorite game, this and, and the FFPC playoff challenge. So super excited to, to do all this playoff content here. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you about the because this is something that's right. The Eagles and the Cowboys play this week, right? So this is this is time limited. But are you going to be attacking that game or the, sorry, those two teams similarly, where you're just playing like I'm going to bet when I'm drafting Eagles, they they lose that game and don't have a buy. When I'm drafting Cowboys, they they lost the game, don't have a buy. Um, you know, we got a similar situation, right? Where these te two teams are fighting for the bye week. So this week, are you going to be kind of drafting in that similar Bills, Eagles, or Bills, uh, Chiefs way? I'm not playing the wild card contest that's currently out. Just the payoff, the payout structure and, and everything for me isn't worth it. Um, I, I'm saving my bullets for the gauntlet and the other contests that are going to come I out. I guess it's also wrong, by the way. This is just for the NFC East. I don't think the Cowboys can really get the bye. Yeah, the, for the Cowboys, Cowboys to get to the buy, buy it requires stuff to happen. The they Eagles have to, they have to lose. throw the 49ers basically on top yeah, the 49ers of the versus lose. Eagles. And the 49ers right, okay. are the 49ers are like the team if the Eagles don't get it. There are some outs to the Cowboys getting it, but but it's not it doesn't work quite the same way it did. So it would be it would be the 49ers and the rather than the Cowboys and 40, it'd be the 49ers mm -hmm. and Eagles, but the, yeah. the same, and, same idea. and the way that I'd probably consider attacking that um I guess I'm, I'm probably playing that more through uh, what I'm doing with the running backs there, if that makes sense, because Christian McCaffrey is such an important player in that. If I'm looking at both those teams, mm -hmm. like, do I, you know, let's just say hypothetically the 49ers make the Super Bowl. Do I even need Brock Purdy to be my quarterback to, to win all the money? Like, because of the way that touchdown scoring works for quarterbacks where it's only four points and the 49ers skill position players are, are so efficient and, you know, you can get rushing touchdowns from Debo and McCaffrey. I'm probably doing it more through how I'm attacking Christian McCaffrey than how I'd be attacking Brock Purdy. But I think you could extend that to Jalen Hurts. And then uh, I'm not going to talk about exactly what the Jalen Hurts relationships are. Uh, would be and how those would change because that's that's going to be only for subscribers because that's a it's easy enough to execute that once i tell you you be like oh my gosh this makes so much sense it's super easy um and it's a huge amount of expected value but uh Look yeah for, it, 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 it would be more through christian mccaffrey on the 49er side and looking to have my quarterback be from the afc if i'm trying to do that so just drafting like christian mccaffrey got the buy is what i would say nice okay so to kind of wrap up here, um, we were talking before we started recording about how basically like almost everything we've talked about is is really just kind of table stakes. And Zach, you think that roster construction in the sense of how many positions you have is actually more important than kind of which teams you've drafted, but it's you have to first build a team that is live to win and then we layer on the roster construction i i don't want to dive too deep because i think this is even if you're like really good at drafting these that that might not be right like to be really good at drafting these right now all you need to think about is the teams advancing but there is this additional layer of 
roster construction being really important. So want to want to do the high level on that before we get out of here. Yeah. So what I'll say right now is the current way, if you're, you know, in, in all these best ball discord channels, or you, you know, you're talking about or reading about playoff best ball content, you'll see lots of people describe a team with numbers like, Oh, I did a, a three, three, four, or I did a, you know, a two, 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 two. Um, and they're describing those numbers are how many players on each team. So I did, you know, three 49ers, three Jaguars and, you know, four Lions or whatever. What I would say is that's almost entirely irrelevant. It's not irrelevant in that you don't need to be thinking about it. It's just that that's like the absolute basics. It's like if we were going to go and play an actual game of football, you were like, dude, I've got the craziest strategy. You tie your cleats before you get on the field (laughs) and you play with tied shoes you are going to run so much faster. Your shoes don't fall off. It's like, yeah, dude, we all know we should tie our shoes. Like, oh, my God. So the thing is, that is, in this game, like 20% of the field doesn't know to tie their shoes, to be clear. It, it, 20% 100%. of the field doesn't know how to tie their shoes. Yes. Yeah. But just getting to above them still isn't enough. Yes. And, and so what I would say is the actual roster construction, how many players of each position you have, where those players are coming from, what types of teams they're on. Are they on big favorites? Are they on underdogs? Are they on, you know, teams with a buy? Um, are they, you know, do you have two teams from the same conference? Do you have three teams from the same conference? You know, how how is that all shaking out? That's one of the most important things to me. And that's some stuff that we'll dive into in the premium content. Yeah, and just to add on to that, as some of my economics professors would want to say, there's a good rule when a measure tries to when you try and make a measure a target it becomes a faulty measure so if you're looking at your team allocation and then after a draft checking boxes of like oh i got three chiefs three niners four cowboys and not really looking at anything downstream of that yeah you might show up with tied shoes but you might not know the form to run the race or catch the football so there are a lot of other things that are far more important and that that framing can even distort or negatively impact how you approach playoff basketball. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yes. So let's say you want to draft three chiefs, three 49ers and four Cowboys. You go into a draft saying, I'm going to draft three chiefs, three 49ers, four Cowboys within reason. Like you start with Travis Kelsey and Tony Pollard. Then you build from there. You're then possibly making suboptimal decisions to fit some preconceived notion of how you're trying to build the team and you're not and you're not going to build the most optimal team because you're trying to hit a checklist at the end so your your economics professor thinks you should let the draft fall to you yeah it's yeah that's a good way of putting it in this context let the draft fall to you because you might then have a different you will probably end up with a three three four but you're taking a premature loss in terms of what the optimal structure could be for any given room. right yeah, and in this okay. case, left the dra- let the draft fall to you is not like, oh, take ADP values. It's know the exact lanes that your first pick or your first two pick have set you on and let the draft choose which lane. Like, it doesn't matter too much on which lane you choose as long as you've predetermined that, like, these are roughly, like, the five to six ways I think my draft could go in which I can build high expected value teams. Doesn't matter too much which one you go to. You should do the one that is easiest for you to accomplish. But there are very specific win conditions that the the first few picks of the draft, both your picks and the overall round or two of the draft, those win conditions are how you succeed in this contest. Draft can decide which ones you go with, but those are not simply oh I built a two three three I built a three four four whatever three four three those are those are not the only win conditions those are byproducts of the win condition and they get you generally on the right path but you should know almost specifically the exact path of like four or five rounds in I mostly know exactly how this draft is going to play out if you're still just trying to fill out the stack minimum requirements you've set you may not end up staying on that path. And halfway through the draft, you could end up punting it off after having a good, successful start. Interesting. All right. So I think that covers everything. We're going to have to um, put our heads together on exactly what the content plan looks like going forward with with, uh, the scheduling of it. But we're going to be rolling out premium podcasts, as I mentioned, and... 
some some additional help on the site. Rankings. Probably rip some drafts together sort. too. Because even just looking at yeah, like we should ADP rip some drafts. And like the Gus Edwards Keaton Mitchell example is perfect. Like, of course, I think Jameer Gibbs and Dave Montgomery are cooler, more fun picks than those guys. But like, you can look at the numbers and, and going through both like just our charts of, of ADP and uh, and like. Uh, playoff odds or conference championship odds, Super Bowls are helpful in the same way that doing a draft and realizing like, oh, Super Bowl running backs could be a hat at the end of the round. Like those are great examples to help illustrate what we're talking about. One thing, Kyle, that you had said um, that I, I've actually I shared when I was describing playoff best ball on uh, DFS MVP last week is talking about these as a choose your own adventure book. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, for anyone kind of familiar with that concept, like, you're you really are as soon as you make a as soon as you make a pick you now live in a reality in which that team is making the conference championship you should be thinking through you know picking teams that not only um you know aren't just a random assortment of teams but you know are limited to the teams that are going to make the conference championship but thinking through teams that are more likely to play that team in the conference championship as opposed to before which we'll, we'll be getting into That'll be something we're trying to work on uh, a tool to help with that, um, to kind of bake that in. But the that's an an important component of it. But, you know, I think the idea of letting the draft fall to you, as long as you're still you're kind of letting the draft choose which which pages you jump to and you choose your own adventure book. But you're still staying on track within that those that type of reality. You 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 said Sack, you were suffering from delirium. Did that uh was that too delirious even even for you? No, no. That's I, I loved when Kyle said it's like a choose your own adventure book. I was like, yeah, spot on. I mean, I, I loved the choose your own adventure books as a kid, and I would read them multiple times over to get all my different adventures, which is kind of how you should look at building your your playoff best ball portfolio. You know, you're you're gonna read this same choose your own adventure book a bunch of times. You're gonna take the different paths as they appear to you. And that's how you get that diversification in your portfolio. You know, you don't have to go seeking it out. It's going to come to you. Um, and, you know, as long as you're not getting down some ludicrous amount of volume where you're like, God, I, I really can't lose a big chunk of this money, like, then don't worry too much about the diversification. Um, and I, I do think that, uh, as Pat mentioned and Kyle mentioned, we'll probably rip some drafts together. Um, I, I would be happy to do some drafts with members of the community in the Discord channel, either as you know, sitting there helping backseat you if you're, you know, wanting questions on your draft or doing some and, uh, and answering questions in the chat. But, uh, you know, let us let us know uh, in the Discord if that's something that would be interesting to you. If you want us to draft alongside you or just want us to post some drafts on YouTube or, or what have you. We're just trying. Honestly, my goal with this is I want multiple people from the community to be shipping these contests with our help. I, I you know, if I can't take one down, the next best thing is that one of you guys slides into my DMs the day after the contest pays out and you tell me a great story about how you binked something and it was because of this little nugget that you took away from something that we did. So I uh, really hope that some of you guys take down the big one uh, this year for playoff best ball. Uh, truly one of my favorite game formats. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. We're uh, we're really hoping legendary upside subscribers are able to take this down. Um, and Discord is also one of the perks of of signing up over at legendaryupside.com. So, thanks guys for for this uh, time, and we'll be coming back at you soon with additional playoff content uh, for you very shortly. Later. And I should have had this lined up. Mm-hmm.